content a little bit, what does that do to water vapour? And we know that in a dry climate, um, it is very different from having a moist climate. A dry climate can have much higher temperatures and much colder temperatures. So water vapour is a major greenhouse gas. It is the major greenhouse gas that keeps our planet benign. If we did not have water vapour, we would be living on a very different world. And then the ice sheets. Greenland ice sheet formed about 2.6 million years ago and it formed during the middle of the current ice age we are in, which started 34 million years ago. It formed when North America joined onto South America. Why they'd want to do that's beyond me, but North America joined onto South America at the Panama. We closed ocean circulation. We closed the heat balance on the Earth. And at the same time, we had massive bombardment of cosmic radiation from a supernova body somewhere out there, and that created a lot of low-level cloud, which led to cooling. And the Greenland ice sheet has been there for two and a half million years, and it waxes and it wanes. But the ice sheet sits in a basin. And if you melt ice in a basin, the water doesn't go uphill. And if you change Greenland ice from minus 40 which is the same Celsius as Fahrenheit, to minus 30, and it doesn't matter what it is, then you're not going to melt ice. So we know that Greenland sits in a basin. What we've recently been finding is that meltwaters trickle down to the bottom and reform as ice. And in fact, the basal ice is growing. But we have been able to drill holes into the Greenland ice sheet and look at how it flows, and it surges. It doesn't flow equally, and we get these massive surges of ice, giving us armadas of icebergs which drop material into the ocean, and we can work out when we had these big surges, and it was when the ice was thick. It was in cold times, not in warm times. So Greenland ice sheet, as you would expect, is changing. The terrestrial glaciers have been retreating, but they've been retreating for the last 350 years. That's because we were in a very cold period 350 years ago and we've been warming ever since. It's totally unrelated to the burning of hydrocarbons. So we go to the other end and we go to the Antarctic ice sheet. And the Antarctic ice sheet is increasing in volume in one part of Antarctica and decreasing in the other. And that ice sheet is growing from the bottom upwards as well as growing from the top down. It also surges. In the West Antarctic ice sheet, it's underpinned by water because sea level has risen some 130 metres in the last um, 120,000, uh, sorry, in the last um, 20,000 years. And we have got an unstable ice sheet. Just to make it even more unstable, a little bit later I'll show you the volcanoes in Antarctica. They are sitting underneath the ice sheet. So that is an unstable ice sheet which is exactly what we've seen in geological time. Ice sheets expand, ice sheets contract. It is quite normal. So let's look at carbon dioxide, and this is just a very basic diagram showing that planet Earth, at the bottom arrow, degasses. And the major gas that comes out of deep degassing or volcanic activity is water vapour. The second most abundant gas is carbon dioxide. And this ultimately ends up in sediments. It goes through a lap through the oceans or maybe through life, and it goes into sediments, and we have an equilibrium. So I want to look at what has happened to carbon dioxide over time. At present, and this is by mass, not by uh, volume, at present, carbon dioxide is a trace gas in the atmosphere. And we humans are adding a trace to a trace. The major gases, like nitrogen, come from volcanic activity. Oxygen comes from life. So we can start to look at a couple of volcanoes, and there are only about 20 volcanoes that are closely monitored. And they are closely monitored for a very good reason, because if they erupt, they kill people. And at these monitoring sites, various features are measured, like the change in the land slope and the change in heat and micro-seismic activity and uh, gases coming out. And we've had to make an amendment, a very serious amendment to this. Now, you've got to remember there are about 1,500 volcanoes 
that we see. And we monitor about 20 of these, and we have very little information on them. Now, you have to ask the question, where did the Earth's original carbon dioxide come from? It was from volcanoes. Since then, it's been doing recycling. But let's look at what these volcanoes do. Just from measuring carbon dioxide in a couple of these volcanoes, we've had to amend the figure. And we see now that four times more carbon dioxide is emitted from submarine volcanoes compared uh, with what the IPCC tells us. But that figure's wrong, because we've only just recently realised how many submarine volcanoes there are. Now, this is a, a schematic model of a volcano. Deep down in the earth, you get a little bit of stretching, you get a little bit of melting, you have a flux which helps you melting. Those fluxes are water vapour and carbon dioxide. And this molten rock is buoyant and it's got dissolved gases and it rises to the surface. As he's leaking out carbon dioxide, at the time it erupts, there's very little carbon dioxide in those melts. So when people are measuring carbon dioxide at volcanoes, they're measuring things that are unrelated to the process. Most of the gas is released before eruptions, some of it during the eruption and some of it after the eruption. We also have some volcanoes that have a lava composed of sodium or calcium carbonate. And these are very well known. And what we also find, and through my geological eyes I find this intriguing, is that you can look back over time at the amount of volcanic activity. And when you have periods of time with intense volcanic activity, you have a high carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere. Now that gets modified by life. But we see that there are some very good relationships. Now this we can also deduce because we know that carbon dioxide is a major gas of the Martian and, and Venus atmospheres. So let's go to some of these volcanoes, the ones that they measure. Krakatoa, I, cr I climbed Krakatoa on my 60th birthday to prove that I could. Um, and really, it's not very interesting. You go to pathetic little volcanoes like at Mount St Helens, not very interesting. A big eruption of 30 cubic kilometres might actually change the climate or the weather for a couple of years. We do measure gases coming out of some of these volcanoes, about 20 of them. So when we hear people talking about how volcanoes don't change climate, they've picked the wrong volcanoes. They're not the ones they see. They're not these sort of volcanoes, and these photographs are from Chile showing that you've got a string of volcanoes along a fracture. And we know that that fracture's been emitting carbon dioxide because bottom right, the white material, is calcium carbonate deposited in hot springs around these volcanoes. We can see that everywhere in the world, that there are carbonate minerals composed of 44% carbon dioxide deposited associated with volcanoes. So if you measure those volcanoes, there's no, no carbon dioxide coming out. It's already come out. You go to Antarctica, you've got this great string of volcanoes sitting underneath the ice. The last significant eruption was in Roman times. And those eruptions changed the dynamics of the ice sheets. Those volcanoes emit some rare gases. For example, Mount Erebus emits a lot of fluorine and chlorine gases. That undoubtedly has an effect on ozone over Antarctica, but it never gets put into the equations. So we have massive volcanoes sitting under ice sheets. We saw one erupt recently in uh, Iceland, but they're not the big ones. The big ones are where we're pulling the oceans apart. And this is where we get basalt volcanoes, and these typically have these pillow basalts where balls of molten rock flow along the ocean floor. And these balls of molten rock chemically react with seawater. And those chemical reactions, and I'm now going to bore you to death, and people who are bored, I'll listen to your head fall onto your plate. These chemical reactions between molten rock in the ocean and seawater keep the oceans alkaline. And these are very well-known reactions where we react minerals with seawater and we keep the oceans alkaline. The oceans have been alkaline since we first had oceans, which was 4,000 million years ago. When we run out of sediment and rock on the floor of the ocean, then they will become acid. 
But don't wait up, because it's going to be a long time. The oceans are buffered from the internal chemistry of the seawater, and they're buffered by the rocks on the seafloor. And experiments where people are looking at what happens to organisms if we have an acid ocean are totally irrelevant because they do not buffer the experiment. So we've known that. We've known it from looking at basalt on the ocean floor for a very long period of time. We've known it from past times. We've had past supercontinents, and I've just put one of them here, Rodinia, that pulled apart. And when it pulled apart, basalt erupted to the surface. So the photograph to the right shows one of these intrusions of basalt. Ever since the beginning of time, we've been having basalt coming to the surface and leaking out carbon dioxide. If that carbon dioxide hadn't have gone somewhere, we would have had an atmosphere full of carbon dioxide. It has been taken out of the atmosphere. We also have volcanoes, which are gas volcanoes. And any of you in the business of looking for epithermal gold know about these gas volcanoes. These are the gas volcanoes where you get a lot of carbonate minerals and you get gold. They are quite well known, and I've taken you to one of the gold ones. This is Takh de Suleiman up in the northwest of Iran, in that little corner between Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Iraq. This is one of King Solomon's gold mines. It was right next to a gas volcano. Here is the crater. So volcanoes don't only eject uh, lava or fragments. They can be gas-driven. We have other volcanoes which are super volcanoes. Bottom left is Tobar. Uh, bottom right is Yellowstone. Now, Tobar erupted in a very big volcano 74,000 years ago. And 74,000 years ago, Tobar in Indonesia meant that the aerosols covered both hemispheres. We ended up with a crisis. We had mass migration. We went down from about half a million humans on Earth to about 800,000. We very nearly became extinct due to this one supervolcano. That's a volcano, not the pathetic things that are mentioned in the IPCC. And these things erupt irregularly, but they are very big eruptions. If you had Yellowstone erupt again, there would be huge problems in North America. Some of us in Australia pray for Talpo in New Zealand to erupt because that's the only way we could ever beat them at football. And they have been big eruptions. And, but there have been even bigger eruptions. And these are the volcanoes that leak out carbon dioxide. And at least two of the five mass extinctions of complex life on Earth have been due to supervolcanoes releasing gases. And one of these um, mass extinctions wiped out 96% of complex life on Earth. So I argue that one volcano can ruin your whole day, but you've got to get a big one, and they come. And what happens is that they put aerosols into the atmosphere,